Okay, well, not a video that I'm very excited to make today. To be completely honest, but we're going to talk about Ravi Zacharias and the scandal that came to light after his death. Uh, that and a few other gospel-related questions pertaining to salvation and morality. So even though I'm not exactly thrilled to make this video today for obvious reasons, it's very disappointing to the church when a person that is thought to be a hero and a great apologist for the faith um, scandalizes himself through his actions and behaviors. Certainly nothing that uh, we could rejoice in in any way, but nevertheless, probably something that we could learn some important things from and to help us frame up our conversations in a gospel way. So uh, here we go, Ravi Zacharias, that's our topic today. Viewer question coming at me. If you're just joining us, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed church just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I would love to see you in person some point. Um, we have services on the Lord's Day, 8.30, 11, and now 4 o'clock p.m. Okay, so let's get into the question of Ravi Zacharias. Obviously, a lot of information has come to light, and I'm not breaking any news here. This is not the kind of channel where I thrill on getting clickbait-type stories about the latest scandal. This is not some page six of the New York Post type of a YouTube channel. In fact, I really try to stray away from this kind of controversial stuff because my goal here is not necessarily to get the clicks. But uh, you've probably read all that's already out there starting a few months ago with the Christianity Today report that came out after Ravi Zacharias had died. And the shocker being that so many of us thought of him as a great gospel herald, some sort of great defender of the evangelical faith, an apologist for Christianity on behalf of historic, biblical, what would seem to be orthodox Christian faith, um, a wonderful debater, a skilled rhetorician when it comes to defending all things uh, Christian doctrine, and yet this tremendously devastating report of his immorality, his failures, and numerous failures that came to light after his death from the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries report. There had been some uh, accusations that came against Ravi Zacharias a number of years ago, and those were fended off by RZIM, uh, basically um, throwing it back on the accuser herself, as though her testimony were merely to damage the Christian reputation of Ravi uh, personally and RZIM more generally. But after further reflection and a great big, bit of research by some independent counsel, it did turn out to be substantiated that most of what was said about him was true. Now, if I'm completely honest, I wasn't a huge Ravi fan myself. In fact, um, I had never read any of his books. I don't think I've read even one Ravi book. Um, I have seen him in action, though. I think I saw him perhaps in person at a Ligonier conference a few years ago. But most of my experience with Ravi came by way of a Sunday school class that we did down at uh, Faith Church in Brooksville, Florida, when we studied one of his video series. I think it was called something like Next Question or Your Question, Please, something like that. It was, it was kind of um, a very general class in which Ravi was filmed um, responding to live questions from a university-based, fairly intellectual audience. And for the most part, if you know Ravi Zacharias, his answers were all very excellent, very precise. Uh, Ravi is known to be able to quote entire passages from some of the great works of Christian theology without even but a glance. Uh, clearly an intellect that is worth, um, you know, worth, worth quite a bit as far as his abilities go. And yet here we are now, after his death, looking in the face of a full-fledged scandal, an obvious moral failure, that includes such things as uh, pornography, um, sexual uh, manipulation, uh, the using of people, um, goods and services, especially related to massage parlors. Apparently, Ravi Zacharias owned a number of massage parlors. And again, I'm not breaking any news here. This stuff is all available on the report. And a number of websites have already reported this, so I'm not even covering any new ground here. But it is somewhat shocking and greatly disturbing the amounts of information that could be found on his own digital devices. And pastors, look, what a warning to us. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, pastors, is, goodness gracious, what a clarion warning about sin's damaging effects on your life, your marriage, your reputation. 
Uh, so many times do we see this in the life of the biblical characters and Christians throughout history and even in contemporary examples that you cannot get away with secret sin. Secret sin will dominate your life. It will always cost more than you ever thought it would cost. It will take you further down into the pit than you ever wanted to go. It will compromise you in ways that you never wanted to be compromised. It will break the caliber of your witness and your integrity more than you ever dared to let it bend or flex on your own. Listen, secret sin will have you for lunch. It will destroy you. You cannot hide it. You cannot keep it hidden for long. And that's what keeps surprising us over and over again is that, uh, you know, we think that we're going to get away with a certain amount of sin. And the bottom line is it, it always will find you out. And I appeal to you if you're watching out there on the interwebs, if you are cherishing some sin in your heart, uh, whether it's a sexual nature or a financial a misdoing or something like that, I can guarantee you it will become known, uh, especially in the ages of the digital world. Do you think, do you really think that as much as we're able to track information, what is searched, what is stored on your phone, that you're ever going to be able to get away with an affair or some sort of a tawdry act or behavior in this digital age? Forget about it. Um, people are going to be able to research us in generations to come more than we, we ever dared to, to put out there as far as information that we're willing to share, it will become known. And if for some reason we escape the digital omniscience of the searches that we're able to do on, on the internet and our phones or our devices and tablets and computers, they are known, of course, to the omniscient mind of God. They will come to light. Scripture warns us over and over that what has been done in the dark places will come out in, into light and will be judged for all the thoughts and words and deeds of our lives. Um, one of the warnings that I, I see in a man's life, and gosh, you know, all this stuff is, is so 2020 in retrospect, right? I mean, you, you, we always see things so clearly in retrospect. You look at the name of the ministry, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Who names a ministry after themselves? Isn't that weird? Was there ever a part of you that uh, saw that? And, you know, I'm always a little bit creeped out when people name ministries after themselves, uh, so-and-so ministries or so-and-so outreach. It's like, I mean, I get I get the idea that um, people want to share the gospel in unique and um, different ways, creative ways even. Uh, you think of like uh, John Piper, what, what he's done with Desiring God Ministries, but there in the title itself is the very focus of the heart of the ministry, Desiring God. You can't accuse Piper of being uh, less than God-centered in all that he says and writes. Now, of course, who knows what secret lives lie behind any of the famous men that we that we look to and, and we regard these days. But one of the clues to me is like who who names a ministry after themselves? There's just something about that that I find a little bit a little bit repugnant. The other thing too is, you know, thinking about these things in retrospect, did it ever occur to some of the members of the board of RZIM that owning massage parlors is kind of a tawdry thing to be into? Now I look if you're a massage therapist, I recognize there's a legitimate enterprise licensed massage therapist. Many people need this that have back or leg or spinal or neck issues. People need massage, but to own massage parlors and to frequent them regularly when on travel, when alone, owning massage parlors, I mean, the whole thing is just weird, right? It just kind of creeps you out. Um, I have been to Thailand one time, and I will say this, that the massage world is everywhere in Thailand. And um, a couple of us were on a missions trip one time, and uh, it was a big group mission trip, 15, 20 people or whatever. We're going to go to the market. Some people wanted to get massages there. And um, I was like, Man, it's just too weird for me. There, There's just something about this that the whole thing creeps me out. It seems less than reputable. Now, again, I'm not judging anybody who's got legitimate back or spine or neck problems. That's totally legit. But to be so into it that you actually buy massage parlors and then to have entertained at least one charge of um, an integrity accusation against him, gosh, you, you just wish that some of this could have been foreseen. And of course it can't be foreseen. We learn, learn these things after the fact, and that's part of the lesson to all of this, uh, but um, 
You know, the other thing that I have to admit really bothers me is these sort of evangelists that have no presbytery. Now, here, I'm going to get all presbyterian on you, okay? For those of you who are in independent churches, like, again, I realize there's something legitimate to the congregational ecclesiastical format. Uh, ask John Owen. He's a congregationalist, right? Ask the the drafters of the Savoy Declaration, although they did basically plagiarize our Westminster Confession of Faith. But the reason that we have a presbytery is so that we would have the built-in accountability of our peers. I've got to tell you this. I'm a Presbyterian myself. I'm part of the PCA. Uh, my presbytery is, a call, is called Ascension Presbytery here. We're in western Pennsylvania. We have a reputation as being a very tough presbytery. Uh, to be ordained here, to be installed here as one of the ministers, it's a tough presbytery to get into. Our standards are high. Our doctrinal correctness is rigorous. And i got to tell you, I would be terrified, literally terrified. I would be shaking in my boots if I ever had to stand before my presbytery and try to defend myself on some sort of a morality or ethics charge. I find that absolutely frightening. I would be undone <laughs> to try to stand before Ascension Presbytery and fend something like this off. And isn't that intrinsically questionable to the one man sort of ministry, the me and my board type of ministry, probably the board being stacked with people that are chosen by hand by the person whose name is on the very placard of the ministry itself, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. I, I just wonder, for those of you who don't have accountability built into your lives, for those of you who are single pastors doing the single pastor thing, for those of you who have ministries named after yourselves, maybe it's time to improve the accountability structures. At least this. Um, now I know some of you aren't Presbyterian, and that's fine. I'm not saying that we're the best. I'm not saying that we have it all figured out. But at least in the Presbyterian world, if you mess up doctrinally, if you mess up ethically, if you mess up morally, if your marriage goes sideways, you will be facing your brothers at the presbytery and answering strict questions as to how and why things have come to be as they are. I personally find that so challenging that it literally helps me to keep on track in my life. Another thing too is simply my relationship with my wife. Um, I don't know Ravi Zacharias personally at all. I don't know anything about his home life or his family life or anything like that. I will simply tell you this. My wife needed to get on my Amazon account the other day. She needed to look up uh, some receipts for our taxes which are coming due. And she said, what's your password? And I said, baby, every password I have is in the password journal. And you have, as my wife, access to all of my accounts, my Google, my Facebook, my Twitter, my Amazon, uh, my YouTube channel. You have access to it all times, no question asked. Um, I would never be one of those husbands who doesn't allow his wife to look at his phone, look at the images I have on my phone, look at my Google Photos, whatever it is I have, total and complete accountability with my with my wife, as well as with my own elders to whom I report at this church, Gospel Fellowship PCA, as well as to my co-laborers in the Gospel and Ascension Presbytery. For me, that's enough terror in, in my life to help to keep me on the straight and narrow. There is something true and real about verifiable accountability. Now, let's get to the heart of the question here, um, because this is the question that actually was posed to me, and it's taken me this long to get to it. Was he saved? Um, what can we say about Ravi Zacharias' salvation? What can be known about the salvation of a man like this, who lives his entire life with such apparent integrity and apologetic rigor and theological discipline, and yet after his death, we come to find out that there's all sorts of tawdry nonsense, shenanigans, and malfeasance going on in his background. What can we say about the salvation of such a man? Well, probably three things. And I'm going to throw out three possibilities here. Two of them I think are possible. One of them I think is not possible. And I'm not going to attempt to judge this man's heart myself. I promise you I will not do that. Um, I am not God, and I have no such counsel to be able to weigh the souls of men. However, here's what we know about the gospel and how it works. Number one, it is possible that this man was a deceiver. Scripture tells us that Satan himself marauds as an angel of light. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians that some men preach the gospel, excuse me, preach the gospel with right motives and others not so much. Okay? 
it is very, very possible that a person who is not saved and is a deceiver and is uh, himself a trap and is a tripwire and a stumbling block can say things that are true, even such that they defend good and right doctrine. And the reason we know this is because in Scripture, Jesus tells us that many will say, Lord, Lord, did I not do these things and more in your name? And yet he will say, I did not know you. So it is possible, at least theoretically, to live a doctrinally wrecked life, uh, to live a life that appears to be scandal-free, appears to be generally moral, and then at the end to find out that this person is not actually converted by the Holy Spirit. Remember, at the Lord's Supper, when Jesus was sitting there with his disciples, he announced to them that one of them would be a betrayer. And as you recall the scripture, did everybody immediately point to Judas and say, yes, it's him, it's obvious, we've known it all along, this is the betrayer? No, that's not what happened. What happened instead is that each man had to ask himself in his own heart, Lord, is it me? Because apparently Judas's life was such in concert, uh, apparently such in harmony with the other disciples that even they who had lived and ministered with him could not tell which of them was the betrayer from the beginning. Now, Jesus knew that because he is the one who knows all hearts. But the disciples were fooled. They did not know. Judas carried on a charade that literally uh, fooled their perceptions up until the very moment that he betrayed the Lord. And so it is certainly possible, number one, that this man was a deceiver who yet spoke truth. Second possibility, and some of you aren't going to like this, but here goes. It is possible that he was a real believer who struggled mightily in his life in the area of sexual temptation. We are not saved by our works. We are not saved by our righteousness. We are not saved by the holiness to which we attain. And in this life, believers will struggle mightily with these sins of the flesh. Read Romans chapter 7. Last night at our Bible study, we talked about the fact that some people see Romans 7 as prior to Paul's conversion. But Reformed believers have traditionally interpreted that Romans 7, Paul's struggle with sin, is his current state even as a believer. Sin is a great and very serious battle all the way up until the moment that we die or until the Lord returns, whichever comes first. And so it is possible that all of Ravi Zacharias' sins have been cast into the abyss, that they have put, been put away. Uh, that they have been blotted out on the register of God's holy account, that his sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. After all, there are many believers in scripture who fell mightily in many ways. David himself was an adulterer. Um, Peter himself denied three times that he even knew the Lord Jesus. And um, so it is certainly possible that these sins would have and been and are, in fact, forgiven because of the gospel. Remember, there's only one unforgivable sin, according to the scripture, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which in my view, most rightly interpreted, is one's final rejection, one's final renunciation of the gospel, and so calling it demonic, that one refuses to accept and to believe and to receive the gospel. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If it's true that Ravi did not commit that sin, then even these grave acts of malfeasance and perversion that they are could and would be forgiven by the grace of Christ. And so it's totally possible that even right now, uh, Ravi Zacharias is clinging to the feet of his Redeemer and Lord who forgave him of his sins and has clothed him in his own righteousness through justification. That is entirely possible and I do not know whether it's number one or number, number two. Maybe you think you know. Maybe tell me in the, in the comments why I'm wrong. But the third possibility, this is the one that I will reject, is that Ravi was once saved and then lost his salvation because of his sin. That does not seem to me to accord with the gospel. The gospel teaches us that all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven by the grace of Christ. And that it is, in fact, not even possible to out-sin the amount of, of uh, forgiveness that God is willing to mete out to us Undeservedly, of course, totally undeserved, but we cannot out -sin God's grace. Um, there is neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, nor things past, nor things to come, which can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I do not believe that these errors, as grave as they are, would cost him his salvation if, in fact, he had been 
truly saved in the first place, which is only between him and the Lord, and only the Lord knows. Of course, Ravi knows now, and the Lord knows, but you and I, we may never. So what do we do with all this? Well, we take this as yet another warning, another evidence of warning that sin can undo and ruin our lives, even our reputation, if we're not very, very careful. I have in my miscellaneous journal a record of men, especially ministers, that have shipwrecked their lives because of sexual temptation. And uh, I don't keep it because, um, you know, 1 Corinthians tells us not to keep a record of wrongs. It's not the reason why I keep track. But I do write these things down because they're warnings to me about how precarious it is for a gospel minister to ruin everything he said, uh, to counterbalance all that he's preached by failing in such a grievous in devastating ways as it now appears that Ravi Zacharias has. Um, in conclusion, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote this book right here, it's a short book, it's called Unknown, The Extraordinary Influence of Ordinary Christians. Um, I wrote this a couple years ago and every once in a while I, I remind my viewers of this because we are so enamored with celebrity Christians. We are so enamored with the people that are uber talented. They have all of these incredible skills and abilities. They're winsome and charming, intelligent and wise and knowledgeable and learned. And we are sometimes so impressed with these people's ability to speak the gospel that we forget how powerful and transformative it is for simple, regular, everyday people like you and me to be faithful to our wives, faithful to our churches, faithful to the truth, uh, living quiet and peaceful lives, even if we never get our names in the paper, never write a book, never publish an article. So much more important for those of us who are ordinary Christians to live faithfully and, and without scandal for the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, thank you so much for watching this short video. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on Ravi Zacharias as well. That's it for now. I do love you lots, and uh, we'll talk to you later.